Thank you for including me. Thank you, Catherine Watson, for including me in the All About Dementia Senior Resource Conference in Houston. I'm Jean Lee. I'm the author of Alzheimer's Daughter, a memoir about both of my parents being diagnosed with Alzheimer's on the same day. Those words sound shocking and it was shocking, but it wasn't unexpected. At the time that I went through this journey with my parents, I was working full time as a third grade teacher. My sister, my only sibling lived a thousand miles away. She in Florida, I in Ohio. That sounds like a recipe for disaster, but in honesty, we grew a stronger relationship during that time. She was the person I called every time I left mom and dad's house. She became my therapist by phone. My parents were age 80 when my sister and I realized we were witnessing some changes. My sister had always remained close to our family, always coming for Christmas visits, summer visits with her children. And at age 80, we began to realize uh, things were changing such as mom was not cooking. Uh, we had always lived in cozy clutter, but the house became uh, a mess. Um, and when she was not at home, I would call her and I, I would relay these little things to her. These odd things have happened. And she suggested, which was one of the best things, a tip that I would give to anyone. She suggested to start a journal. And that journal was really so that she and I could communicate with one another rather than calling her and saying, well, that this odd thing happened today. I could open up the journal and I'd say, well, over the past two days, these are the things that have happened. I started that journal at age 83 and we did not actually get an official diagnosis for my parents until age 86. Even at the time I started writing these things about them, I felt tremendous guilt in writing down my parents' shortcomings. Um, I kept these little anecdotal, anecdotal notings in a black spiral bound journal that none of my third graders wanted because it was black, it wasn't a pretty color. And I think I chose the color black because I felt so bad about documenting what I was writing. In fact, I wanna to write to you what I put at the very beginning of the journal. This is a journal of the aging process of Ed and Abby Church started when they are age 83. I feel pain, sadness, and guilt as I begin entries because my parents have given my sister and me life, faith, and everything we need to become self-sufficient women. I document only to show a progression that may be helpful for the purpose of medical diagnosis and for decision-making related to our parents' safety. Now I wanna share my screen with you because I've created some slides that will help focus us in my talk. So these are some pictures of my parents when they met, when they married, going on their honeymoon. I just wanted to include some pictures so that you might come to know a little bit about them. So I've spoken to you about the initial changes and about keeping a journal. And what I didn't know in starting that journal was that it became a major factor in their diagnosis. Um, at the time I started keeping it, we were meeting just with their regular internist, but eventually 
we were led toward other doctors. And when we got to a gerontologist, they wanted to see that journal because it, it uh, was evidence to them of what was happening and frequencies of what, what was happening. Um, in addition to that, my sister was able to email with the doctor behind the scenes. And that's something I would suggest to any of you who are seeking a diagnosis in addition to keeping a journal. If it's very hard to talk about these things in front of your parent when you're sitting in an appointment. You, you love your parent and you feel like you're betraying them when you talk about these things. But if you can email the doctor behind the scenes and also keep a journal, I think it will be helpful for you. Secondly, my second slide here is about moving them out of their home. Um, as I was seeking the diagnosis, I knew that they needed to be somewhere else besides their home. They weren't safe. Neither of them could um, take care of the other and neither of them tattled on the other. They uh, came, went through this journey hand in hand so I had checked out some care communities behind the scenes and had settled on one that I thought would work for them and had taken them to visit that uh, care community. And at the time I did, I remember them being so reluctant. It was like pulling two puppy dogs along on a leash and they had their brakes on. They did not wanna be there, um, even though the care community had tried to introduce them to healthy living people there. Um, they did not want to move away from their home. I would say that the clean out of their home was, those were just the darkest days for me. And for any of you who are in this position, you understand completely. Um, my parents were World War II, depression, post-depression era savers. They kept every butter tub, every Cool Whip container, every mismatched lid. Uh, those were all in the basement. Um, they were shoppers who loved to bring home a deal. Many of the clothes in their closets even still had tags on them. Um, they're they shopped for groceries without, mom would go without a list and she'd just buy things that were familiar to her. And I think when I cleaned the house out, it was a small ranch house and I found 34 rolls of aluminum foil there. Um, every school project, every, every report card I'd ever received and my sister had, um, these were in the basement, just molding away in the mildew there. Uh, driving them away from that home was gruesome. And I'm telling you this, many of you know this, you know what I'm saying when I talk about driving your parents away from their home. Um, I worked every night after work for six months, I would, I would come to their house after work and continue cleaning through that house to have it sold in six months after I moved them because we needed the proceeds from the sale of the house to sustain their living in a senior care community. I would say that they probably lived in that community for in, in an independent apartment for about two years. And then we were, there were some health issues that happened that we needed to move them into assisted living. Um, they needed medications, they needed help uh, getting dressed, help to get them to meal time on time. And I think our stay in assisted living, their stay in assisted living lasted about six months. And at that point, I received a call uh, from the community uh, 
saying they needed to meet with me. And as a teacher myself, I just had a very foreboding feeling. It was like being called to an unscheduled conference for your child uh, at school. And those don't happen for good reasons usually. And uh, so the meeting I attended, there were six professionals from the care community and myself and my sister was on the phone remotely. And they told us they just could not keep our parents in that community anymore. It was not safe for them. Um, and that was, that was just a blow because my parents really had acclimated quite well to that community. At the same time though, I really admired that care community for being so honest with me and wanting to keep my parents safe. Um, I tried to make it work just a while longer by hiring a caregiver to come in for them. And I don't know, some of you may have encountered this, but that did not go well um, for me to have a caregiver there with them because I think my mom felt as though her turf was being violated and she did not want someone else uh, trying to care for my dad and for her. So that only lasted about a week. And then we had to move them to a secure, another facility that had a secure memory care unit. So that's something I would suggest to you too, as you're checking out places, if you have to move, if you're anticipating a move of your family member, make sure that that where you're moving them has progressive lev levels of care and can keep them until the end. We knew that the facility where we moved them had skilled nursing, but they did not have a secure memory care unit. So I would definitely suggest that to you. My dad in these pictures, my dad just loved his vegetable, vegetable garden and my mom, her flower garden. And there were just so many things that were hard about moving them out of that home and that loss of independence for sure. Um, this little picture down here of the letter and the writing and the two pennies that uh, comes into play as I wrote the book. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Caregiver guilt. I, I don't think there is anyone who escapes this. Um, I felt so guilt filled throughout the whole process, moving my parents out of their home. These were the people who had given me everything in life. They had given me every advantage in life. And I was slowly taking every bit of everything away from them, taking things away from the people who gave me everything, not only things, but just their independence, taking, stripping them of all of that slowly, slowly. I think as a family caregiver, you understand that that every day you feel like you're taking more away. So how do we ever move past the guilt of that? And I think that's what we really want to talk about today. I'm sharing my journey and the things I've learned through that journey, but how do we move past that guilt? So if you could take just a moment and maybe think of in your mind the top two things that cause you guilt in your caregiver journey. And I'll just be quiet while you think about that for a moment. These are things that I'd like for you to share with me in the um, meeting after this session. I would love to hear from you about your causes of caregiver guilt.
in in every journey, I think we only survive by looking for silver linings. If we don't look for the silver linings, we never recover. Um, For me during that gruesome time of cleaning out the house, there was a huge silver lining. And I don't mean to sugarcoat this because every night that I went to that house after work, it was gruesome. Um, There were so many memories there and I was disposing of them. I couldn't bring those things to my house. I, very few of them. I, I brought my mom's dining room table and, you know, a handful of other things, but there's a limit to what you can keep. So it was a very gruesome time. I wished in all of these things that they had kept, that they would, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if there were just the, the memories attached to them, you know, with tape or a paper clip or something so that I would know what meaning these things had. However, when I was cleaning out a closet in their house, I came across a box that I had never seen before. It was a little gold box of had like gold file of foil on it. And um, I heard some jingling in it. I opened it up and they were my parents' love letters from World War II. And they were all neatly stacked in this little, it was a Hallmark box, neatly stacked like little files in a file cabinet. And the jingling was my dad's dog tags on the top of those letters. And I took that box home and my sister and I moved that box with our parents each place that they had to move and and our parents would look through those letters and and my sister and I thought we have no right to look at these they were not written for our eyes. My mom died a year before my dad and after my dad died my sister and I stood over my trash can and actually dumped those letters in because we thought they were not meant for our eyes. We're not going to look at them. And then my sister took one out and started peeking at them. She said, let's just peek. And those letters became the chapter beginnings in Alzheimer's daughter. And so I feel like for me, a huge silver lining was that I got to tell this story and their words exist in it as well. Um, When I began to write Alzheimer's Daughter, it was really written just for my family so that my sister's children and my children would have a history of Alzheimer's in our family. And, but I, I joined a local writing group to help me write it well. And they um, said, Jean, this has a larger scope than your family. And they encouraged me to publish it. Um, It took me four years to write it. And I published it with great guilt. In fact, when I pushed the publish button, I really felt like I could be struck by lightning. I'm not kidding on that because my parents were such private people. And I was so filled with guilt from revealing personal things about our journey in this book. Um, One, only one week after my mom died, when I was sitting with my dad, he said to me, he, he said, where is that woman I admired? And he couldn't even remember my mom. And at that point, I thought, okay, this may be a story that can help others. And and that helped me um, be brave enough to publish it as well. You know, at at one point, I remember another silver, silver lining. There came a point, and there may in your journey as well, if your parents come to not recognize you or know you or be unable to speak to you, I just 
took them smiles. It was all I had to give at that point was my smile to them. And, and you can see from these pictures that they always had a smile back. I was very lucky in that, that they retained their pleasant personalities. After my book was published, as I told you, I published it with, with such um, guilt that I, I really hoped that it would just grow dust and mold in Amazon's basement. But part of the healing process for me, and we all need to find our own healing process, was connecting with other writers who had also written about Alzheimer's. I am a reader. I've always been a reader. I've always solved problems by reading. So when I was in the midst of this journey with my parents, I read everything I could get my hands on. Anyone who was willing to tell, share a personal story about their experience with a loved one with Alzheimer's and dementia. And so without knowing that, these people had helped me in my journey because I had read their books. And it ended up that I sent my book to Marianne Shuko, uh, who's the author of Blue Hydrangeas. And I asked her if she might read it because I, I was getting some kind reviews, which shocked me. I, I really thought when I published it, people would say, oh, you're such a bad daughter for publishing these things. Um, but I was getting some nice reviews and Marianne Shuko had written this beautiful book. And she said, Jean, this is a lovely book. Would you help me promote other works like this? And who else have you read? And I told her that I had read Vicki Tapia's book, Somebody Stole My Iron. So we reached out to Vicki and we started with a mission of gathering books written from personal experience with Alzheimer's and dementia for the purpose of supporting those who are currently on the journey. And that vision became allsauthors.com. We now, we started Alls Authors in 2015 and now we have over 270 authors writing for us. Um, we feature their books. We feature a new book each week. So we have books written by adult children like me, by spouses, by grandchildren who are caring for a, a person with Alzheimer's and dementia, four children, four teens, uh, books written about family conflict, books written by professionals who are caregiver guides, but every book that we feature has to be written through the viewpoint of a personal experience with Alzheimer's and dementia. And so to conclude, I would just like to point you toward allsauthors.com as support for your own journey, whether you're a family caregiver, whether you are a caregiver working in a long-term care facility, we've got books that will support your journey. And I hope you check us out. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to just say that things that I would pass on to you for your journey that I think could be helpful for you are first of all, to stay connected to your family. And I know that's not easy because not all families get along and you may be the person giving the care and your siblings may not be supportive of you, but try as much as you can to keep your family informed about what's going on with your loved one. What's, be honest about what's going on with you, about the help that you need. So number one, stay connected with your family. Number two, I would suggest keeping a journal because it really could be helpful 
to you at some point in a diagnosis. And who knows, it could turn into a book. <laughs> Number three, read. For me, that was the biggest help through my journey. I would devour a book and late at night be looking for the next one on Kindle that I could download. Even though not every experience was like mine, none of them were exactly like mine. Um, everyone had some kernel of truth that helped me move forward. And lastly, reach out and learn. Learn all you can to help support your journey so that you can come through this healthy and whole. Thank you so much for listening to me today. And thank you, Catherine.